welcome back everybody to another episode of the nonprofit show. I'm really excited for our guest, Amy Showalter, the woman that's going to explain advocacy and all things, dare I say, policy oriented. Welcome, Amy. Thanks for having me, Julie. I look forward to talking to your uh, folks today on this very important topic. You know, it is very important, and I'm thrilled that you're here with us. I can't imagine how busy you are at this time. Um, we we're in a general election. There are a lot of policy uh, issues and topics, and uh, wow, this is going to be really interesting because I think that we in the nonprofit sector, we get a little wigged out by the concept of policy, and so you're going to help us to kind of frame this up a little bit. I'm really, really interested in what you have to say. Um, but but first, before we get into this, I want to make sure that we spend a second here and thank all of our presenting sponsors. They include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Fundraisers Friday, our new episodes on Friday, and your part-time controller. We are so, so delighted with this new co-host panel that we've assembled. They come from throughout the country. They do all different things. And I'm one of those co-hosts, Julia C. Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. Okay. The woman of the hour, Amy Showalter, CEO of the Showalter Group. Talk to us about what the Showalter Group does, because it's really interesting when you go on and you read um, your your work on your website, showaltergroup.com. But give me the direct scoop, Amy. Yes, yeah, so the direct scoop, Julia, is that I, many moons ago, was a legislative aide in the state Senate uh, here in Ohio. I enjoyed that. I saw how effective, ordinary, uh, because I, I put in air quotes because they're actually extraordinary, uh, citizens mm -hmm. were at communicating issues to elected officials and how persuasive they are in that setting. And I thought, hmm, that's that's interesting. That's where the action's at. It's it's professional lobbyists out there, which I became one after I left the state house, where I was a lousy lobbyist, I will say. But I recognized that I had a skill and talent and enjoyed working with my stakeholders with the small business division of the Ohio Chamber of Commerce, where I worked. And because I saw that they were really making an impact, that legislators listened to that. And um Ever since then, I, I decided I went to Nationwide Insurance and worked with their employees to get employees excited about um, issues like verbal thresholds and combined ratios and, and those kinds of topics relative to the jobs in the insurance industry. And then I had a lot of people talking to me about how do you do this? What's this grassroots advocacy all about? How do you engage in that? How do we get our people involved in our issues? And I, I just loved it so much that I then started my practice uh, some 20, 24, 25 years ago. At the turn of the century is what I say to people sometimes. Oh my God. I've never heard anyone say the turn of the century. I'm going to totally borrow that. I'm going to totally borrow that. <laughs> That's true. Great. You know, it, it warms my heart to hear you say that legislators do listen to their constituents and the power of going to the seat of of the legislature, no matter where you are, um, you know, in this country, I, I think this is a, a fundamental thing that we can forget or we become so disengaged with. Um, but in the nonprofit sector, this is like one of those things that for so many people, it's easy to do because they're driven by this mission and compassion and their, their heart. They just don't necessarily know how to align these things. And so, mm -hmm. Very, very interesting to have you here to talk about this. The first thing I want to launch right into is how nonprofits can do this and how they can impact policy. And back in the day, and I still hear this, you know, we were always told that if you lean into policy, you can lose your 501c3 status. So let's start with that because that's a fearful barrier for a lot of organizations. Yes, it is. And I can tell you uh, without uh, any fear of uh, being incorrect on this, that that's, it's a myth that nonprofits can't engage in advocacy or even to use the word lobbying. Uh, they're allowed to engage in those, in those activities. The uh, IRS actually in their regulations has stated that they have always wanted 
not-for-profits to make their voices heard in, in that. I, I've got the exact language here, you know, from the IRS on that. So they, it's something they want organizations to do. But yes, there's definitely been that myth out there. Um, there are guidelines when you decide to engage in advocacy and we can go into, let me know when you want me to go into the, you know, there are different things you can do. And I like to focus on what you can do in the settings. And um, there's, you, you can have lobbyists on your team. It's just that there's a certain amount of money. You can't spend more than you know 20% of your organizational income you know, on that particular aspect of your overall budget. You know, can't spend more than 20%. And then this, there's a sliding scale, the more the organization takes in. That's why some very large nonprofits will actually make an election to be a, a 501H because then they can spend more money. And, um, but they have strict reporting requirements as well. But there's a lot you can do. And in fact, everyone from American Heart Association, and I've worked with all these groups and I'm gonna share with you, American Cancer Society, Pet Partners, the Therapy Pet Organization, yeah. the United States Green Building Council, the Girl Scouts of America, all of these organizations have advocacy uh, departments, have advocacy mm -hmm. initiatives, have issues that they try to impact at the state and federal legislative levels. And we were there at the beginning at, with many of those, helping them build the capability to do that. So, and a couple of them have even had me conduct a specific seminar on nonprofit doesn't mean not lobbying. I mean, that's how that's how much we have to get over that, that hump still in the nonprofit sector. But I, I think it's changing. Definitely. I've been around long enough that it's, it's definitely changing. And it is a great value to an organization's stakeholders. I've seen, you know, I've seen research showing that many people contribute to a particular charity because of their advocacy work with state mm -hmm. and federal lawmakers. So it can be a real member benefit as well. You know, I love that you, first of all, broke through this myth um, because I think it's frightening when stakeholders who know what's going on and can really provide a tremendous amount of information um, feel that they don't have, they have no voice, mm -hmm. you know, and that there's a compliance issue. And so then they, you know, they don't offer their research, their knowledge, their connectivity, you know, their advisement, I realize that there's, um, you know, there's structure and there's compliance as it should be. And that there are things that you have to do in terms of registering and, and engaging and all that. But um, I, I just love, I, it's just fabulous to hear you share this knowledge with our viewers and our listeners. Um, I want to ask you about this heavy lift because for so many organizations, they're going to be like, okay, great. We need to, you know, bring a voice to the table. But you listed some very large organizations. Should we look at this on our own for their own organization or should we form collectives? I mean, all the food banks in a state getting together. I mean, what, what do you see on that spectrum? Yes, good question. And there are pros and cons to both approaches. So... <laughs> As there is with everything in life, right? So, yes. so let's look at some of the advantages. The advantages of joining with other like-minded organizations is that there's more influence. And, and I believe influence is a good thing. It means that both parties agree that they're getting something from it versus coercion. So let's so right. influence is a good thing. So yeah. there's more influence that you can have because you've got more voices speaking on your behalf. You've got that connectivity that you mentioned because someone in one organization might know a particular lawmaker. In another organization, they know different lawmakers, so they're really getting this broad, diverse voice out there. And elected officials love diversity of voice because it protects them, because they can say, well, I've got Republicans for this, I've got Democrats for this. So that's a, that's a nice advantage. The There's more resources, obviously. One of the group's weakness is another group's strength, so you can really work well together. Now, the disadvantages are those same things. But then, of course, more voices. So that means, well, who's going to make the decisions? Who, how much autonomy does my group have to speak out on their own? And how much do I have to pay a certain amount of money to be a part of this coalition? Are we going to pass the hat for money for this? How are we going to fund it? Um, how will we make decisions? Who is respond Who's our lead spokesperson? Do they have credibility? Um, because we know that fair or unfair, this is where 
all organizations are challenged is that if you're in a coalition, as a lot of nonprofits are with other groups for advocacy, and one <clears> member <throat> of that coalition is not deemed credible by the media, online, by lawmakers, then it paints the whole coalition as not being credible. We tend to go to that negative side of that equation and mm -hmm. fair or unfair. So we want everybody to be credible. We want our top spokesperson to be credible. Uh, we have to determine what are our success metrics? How do we know as a group that we'll be successful? Whereas if you do this as an individual organization, you can determine that pretty quickly because you're a little more, you're more nimble than if you've got nine other organizations you have to coordinate with. So there's, yeah. there's pros and cons. There's no right or wrong answer. It's very contextual. You know, it seems to me, Amy, that if you are going to do this, this is a, a strategy that's not for the faint of heart. You need to not just jump into it, but you need to understand. I, I loved what you said. You know, what's the metric for figuring out when we've been successful? What are we trying to achieve? You know, things of that nature. Those are deep dive questions, whether you're in a group or you're by yourself. Right. I mean, yes. and that's a heavy lift. <laughs> yes. What I, what I find with this just isn't a nonprofit dynamic, but I hear about it more with nonprofit clients. And maybe it's because they have this reticence to see themselves as having a powerful voice and having an influential voice. They feel like, Oh, we can't, we can't, no, we can't. It's like, no, you are influential. That's okay. Yeah. That's okay. But they many times look at their um, awareness versus results. Awareness mm -hmm. versus the, like, Oh, well, our campaign was successful because we created, we have more awareness of our issue. Well, on planet Amy, awareness is not the metric. <laughs> when I work with clients, it's about that's a step in the influence yeah. process and a step in the persuasion process, mm -hmm. but it's not the result. The result is, are you changing hearts and minds of elected officials of the public and so forth? So that's where I see um, nonprofits, especially everybody gets for-profit organizations have challenges with that too, but I see it more in the nonprofit world because yeah. they love awareness. They're all yeah. about and awareness is good for their other efforts. And, but it's just a step in the influence process. It's not the result. Wow. You know, I love that you brought that up because <laughs> to me, um, I see that concept bleeding over in a lot of ways. I mean, a lot of ways we, we do talk about this as awareness and branding and, and, you know, the mission and, and that value, but it is a lot more um, intelligent and respectful of your donor investors money and resources if you can define what that ultimate goal is mm -hmm. and um i think that's just genius i think it's a it's a big question mm -hmm. not as you know, can't just you know oh yeah we made impact no you you have to really uh set out what those what those goals are mm -hmm. before you yeah. ever get going yes and there are there are definitely are success metrics you can look at and i think that's one of the things I like to work with, work through with groups. And I, I remember on one of your previous guests a couple of months ago, um, Miriam, Miriam Dix was talking about internal assessments and looking at what you have and your resources and what the needs are and the capabilities are. And that's a part of this process as well. You know, it was looking at, okay, what in those success metrics, I think are a part of that equation too. What, what does that look like for us? Whether it's like your board of directors. I know uh, many nonprofits that have been doing this for a while, but they, they have their board of directors. But then they will also establish um, an advocacy task force, an advocacy committee, um, yes. something like that. So, and that's helpful because then you're getting people who are generally um, they they have what I call the advocacy lifestyle. It's in their DNA. They can't not advocate for for a particular cause. So they they're adept at this. They know elected officials, or they know how to connect with them, and so they can be very valuable in helping organizations build their capability but it's something you want to have a you know a facilitated meeting and talk about like what what does this look like what are we going to do what are we not going to do what are we going to play where are we not going to play right. you know keeping it within your rules legally of what you're allowed to do and not do which we can go over later but it's uh, definitely getting you know agreement on success metrics when you start something like this is really important mm -hmm. people don't like ambiguity as you know i mean they want to know what how do we know we're successful well and it's expensive it's expensive to start off and not know where you're going because you end up doing a lot of different things. And then you're, you're like, well, what, did, what do we have to show for it? So mm -hmm. I really want to get back to, first of all, 
this amazing thing, this amazing concept that yes, we can and we should be engaged in policy. Talk to us about this grassroots advocacy, because it seems to me that when we use that term, mm -hmm. it's a little bit more palatable yeah. and it doesn't seem like it's going to ruffle the feathers of some of our donors. Yes. What do you see when we, we use those terms and we look at that structure? Yes. Well, when I see when I see grassroots advocacy and, you know, I, I got involved in the grassroots advocacy world when people actually people would say to me, I've not heard of that before. Um, your job is that one where you're going to get laid off if you do something like that, because I can't see this having a future. <laughs> I was like, oh. yes. that was at the end of the day. Now it's an industry. I mean, it's an industry. I mean, it, yeah. You talk about, you know, all the robo calls you get and all that. That's for candidates. That's mm -hmm. grassroots advocacy. Fair and unfair. Mm -hmm. But uh, in our organizationally, grassroots advocacy simply means it's decisions made or influence taking place at the ground floor, at the position at positions that are not in power of the underdogs of the people who don't have the title and the authority they're the ones making their voices heard so that those in authority and with the titles and the power and the decision making authority so they have to listen to them and our government fortunately is structured in a way that if generally if a lawmaker wants to or a candidate wants to win election or wants to have that particular job they have to listen to those individuals. And um, a lot of times we think grassroots advocacy just has to do with electing certain candidates. Well, actually, no, and the IRS views that as electioneering, which nonprofits are not to get involved in. You're not to advocate for the election or defeat of any candidate, but you can advocate for your issues that affect those you serve and affect your mission, you know, of your organization. So it's really grassroots advocacy is making your voice heard at that level where there's not a seat of power. So, you know, quote unquote, I will say, because I view, as I said, I view the grassroots to have the power. They're, they're the ones that have the power to me. And many in the grassroots of a charitable organization are very influential people in their communities and states, are they not? And nationally, mm -hmm. and they can get things done. Yeah. And that's why it, that's a good thing. And that's why nonprofits, I believe, um, wield a lot of influence is because the people who work with them and sit on their boards are very influential. And lawmakers know that. They know who they are. <laughs> well, you know, I'm thinking like never get between a mother and her ill child. You know, mm -hmm. women that have have a child with autism or cancer or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, being that person that can speak to a legislator or a policy, you know, advisor, whatever, uh, through the chain of command to, to educate them about what, what is needed, what's going on, stats, metrics. I mean, nonprofits are doing a lot of research. Oh, yes. Yes. And yeah, they're, they're, they're the forefront of that. So they've got that data there. And then they've got the stories, the narrative of the individuals. So, you know, adversely or beneficially impacted by things that happen at the policy level, because there are fair or unfair, and it really comes down to funding for a lot of these groups. Some of them do get public funding. So it can come down to advocating that your stakeholders get access to clinical trials, that the NIH gets more money for cancer research, that there's more studies about the effects of social media on girls' development and things of that nature. So all those mm -hmm. things are decided at the public policy level. And I think it's doing a disservice to a charity's donors and, and stakeholders not to make your voice heard. I mean, the, in the, the point of influence and in having that is speak up for people that don't have a voice. That is the sole reason any of us have influence is to speak up for people that don't have it. So we want to maximize that in these charitable organizations because frankly, they do have a better legislative brand than um, large corporations do mm -hmm. uh, to a great degree um, because lawmakers view them and rightly so as having less uh, of a vested interest in some other things. And so they, they feel much more uh, safe uh, supporting the interest, public policy interests of various nonprofits than they do for profits. I, I can attest to that. It makes sense. And I love that you separated that out because it's clear that um, we can take a passion and a mission and give voice to it. Yes. 
Before we go on, how different is it from state to state when it comes to compliance and the things that you have to do? I mean, you're sitting in, in Ohio and what do you see around you going on? Yeah, well, in terms of compliance, uh, state to state, I don't see a big difference in the nonprofit sector because I, I've been brought in to different national groups where there's people from all different states, state chapters there, and we have the right. same curriculum for all of them. It's really regulated more at the IRS level and so forth. Um, so that's not that's not an issue. The only thing that would be an issue is if one of them decided, yes, we want to have an affiliate political action committee, which I don't recommend, but if they said, yeah, we want to have an affiliate organization that has a PAC, then the laws state by state are a little different if they're giving to state candidates in terms of how much money they can give and so forth. Um, I do know that depending on what state you're in and the political proclivities of that state, um, and I get this from one of my uh, environmental groups, nonprofits that I've worked with, they'll say, you know, hey, the, what you can do in um, Indiana, we can't do you know, in California. Or what we can do in California, we can't do in Indiana yeah. with our issues and our public policy. So that is a dynamic. That's the big difference I see is that it used to be, and it, it still is, the state level is where a lot of nonprofits can make great progress because mm -hmm. the partisanship isn't as great as at the federal level, but that's sadly mm -hmm. changing. And mm -hmm. I heard that with a group of probably 20 different state advocacy directors and lobbyists from a major environmental nonprofit where they said, Amy, we can't, I can't, what you're saying is great, but I can't, that can't be accomplished here. In right. my state, but it can over here. So it depends where you're at. You can kind of look at the, the, the nonprofit and their, you know, whether they're health-based or environmental-based, different things, and then look at, okay, what's the comp composition of my state legislature? And that does it. But that's why the nonprofits have such an advantage because you've got board members who ostensibly are probably all over the political spectrum. I mean, the yeah. electorate's divided. 50 50 pretty much so you've yeah. got a great advantage in that you've got leaders of your organization who are republican and who are democrat and who are independent yeah i love that you said that too because i think a lot of times depending on what our issues are they you know i think the 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 feeling is it's going to transcend um you know the political spectrum and, and get to a, a bigger discussion um, but again, unless you know what that process is, um, as as you've been teaching us today, um, it seems like a slog, like how are we ever going to get through it? And so I love kind of reframing this and looking at it. We don't have a lot of time left, but I do want to touch on something that you mentioned, mm -hmm. and that's the PAC. I mean, mm -hmm. right now, of course, we're in this political season. We're hearing all about different PACs. We see them every night. Um, on TV, funding ads, radio commercials, even in our mailboxes with with uh, mailers. What do you, and of course online? How could I forget that? Yes. yes. What do you see um, as something that we should be thinking about if we're a nonprofit looking at advocacy? Yeah. Um, well, I I would say the biggest thing to think about is focus on what you what you can do. Because, like I said, if if you're a nonprofit and you think, well, I want to I want to get into that game of the advertisements and all that, that is a you you are into um, a, 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 establishing really another organization. And I don't know if you, that's a, and that is a heavy lift. You would have to have outside legal counsel, uh, outside consulting to make that happen. And it's um, unless you can raise a lot of money because it's a big money game now. Unless you can raise a lot a lot of money. Your, your contributions to any particular candidate probably aren't going to mean that much. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, and I, there's one national group, I believe that, I think it was the Association of Fundraising Professionals. Yes, that's a group. They established a PAC. They established a PAC a few years ago, but they only raised like $25,000, which mm -hmm. is a decimal test, but in the world, in the world of federal contributions uh, it, to the candidates for Congress, it's, yeah. it's decimal dust. Okay. So, but, to them that had value and they probably had a directive from their members. So it's, you know, it depends. There's no right or wrong answer. It's just not easy. That's what, what I'll say. It's just not easy. We want to remember that you can engage in nonpartisan issue education on your issues to your members. I think we as nonprofit leaders, there's a responsibility to inform your donors and stakeholders of, and the people you serve of legislation at the state and federal level that can impact who you serve and your mission and what you're doing. That, that's a responsibility you have. You can publish 
uh, voting scorecards. You can publish the record of how particular lawmakers, how lawmakers voted on your issues. The only rule on that is that you don't want to do it during the election, the campaign season. So I wouldn't do it in the summer or the fall of an election year. But any other time, here's our here's our top issue, House Bill One. Here's who's voted for it. Here's who's voted against it. That's empowering your your people. You can do voter registration drives. You can join mm -hmm. the collectives, the collaboratives, like you mentioned. You can do that. You can do social media campaigns you know, for your issue. The big thing to remember is all you got to do is not is don't endorse any candidate. Stay out of the people. Focus mm -hmm. on the issues. You can mm -hmm. have candidate forums. You can have people come and talk to your employ your uh, board, your employees, mm -hmm. as long as you invite people from both parties and you mm -hmm. keep that on record and do that and have a written you know copy of that. Mm -hmm. uh, and to have them come and talk to your your members about anything, and uh, that's considered that's an advocacy activity people can engage in, and you're completely allowed to do that. Mm -hmm. So I think all these things are great benefits mm -hmm. to donors and to to members. So you know, and getting your people engaged to lobby on I say lobby to lobby on your behalf. Let's say I want to have people go to city hall one day for me. Mm -hmm. I can do that. It's considered yeah. it's lobbying. It's not. Anything I have to report to the IRS, you know, when I when I encourage my members to do that. Yeah, you know, we interviewed um, an animal welfare expert. Your, I would imagine, mm -hmm. close to three years ago, and I remember that she told us, and they were somewhere in the Midwest that they took um, therapy dogs one day to the legislature and just took them throughout the campus, and it was. And, and they had like a very simple kind of like packet flyer that talked about, you know, their interest and in what they were doing and um, how they dovetailed into animal welfare and all this stuff. And it ended up, they were terrified to do it. It was like such a, a frightening, stressful thing. And then um, halfway through the day, they were like, okay, when are we gonna do this next time, next year? They got so into it, they got such great feedback they felt welcomed, they felt part of the process. And it really changed the trajectory, mm -hmm. I would say, Amy, of how they saw themselves. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, we have a voice, we are an influential organization. And it was really interesting to learn about that, specifically because they they took the visit, right? Yes, and I, I, I like what you said about how they viewed themselves differently. Right. It, it is empowering and it's yeah. something where, yeah, it takes time and effort to put something like that together. Mm -hmm. But I've were I it's funny you mentioned that because I wonder if it was pet partner, pet partners, a therapy, pet therapy group that I'm affiliated with because one of my dogs is a registered uh, therapy pet. And so it's near and dear to my heart. But when we worked with them, we were able to get um, a key legislator who had had no one come and talk to her mm -hmm. about allowing therapy pets in the courtroom to be there for children, abused children, when they testify. Many wow. times they, they feel better if they have a therapy pet, they're with them sure. and they become more, um, they're, t they talk more openly when they have that therapy pet with them. Sure. And it's against law. You know, have, some judges weren't allowing it in their courtrooms. And so they wanted to get that changed. And thank goodness they found this particular lawmaker and there was an advocate, she had never done this before. But she took her dog to meet with the lawmaker and the lawmaker said, you're the only one that's talking to me about this. The, but now I'm on your side and I see it and I'm going to be a champion for you on this issue. And that was just one person you know, right. to, to engage and change things for children all over that state. I love it. Well, that that is a great way for us to end uh, today, our time with you, Amy. I have so enjoyed this. I love how you painted a, a wide picture for us to expand how we think about ourselves, how we think about communicating ab about our organizations and the impact and the policy that goes hand in hand with our success so often. You know, we, we need to be involved uh, in this bigger picture discussion. And so thank you for making it um, something we can think about. There's a lot to know. And I would uh, encourage anyone thinking about this to go to the showwaltergroup.com site and you can learn more about Amy and the show Walter group, what they do and how they do it and, and things to look for. Amy, you offer trainings as well? Mm -hmm. Yes, oh yes, all those groups I've mentioned. Uh, it's been really fun to see them ascend you know, to Advocacy Heights because I was working with them when they really didn't have an advocacy presence. And so yeah, we train uh, nonprofit volunteers, members, staff 
many times we'll work with the staff and say, here's how you do this. Here's how you implement a program like this. Here's how you can conduct a state lobby day. And so we'll do that in a very, very customized way. We also have some very encouraging stories uh, in my book, The Underdog Edge, which I will get to you, uh, Julia, which uh, is a compilation of very successful underdogs, many who were nonprofit volunteers, who talked to elected officials and got them to change their mind on an issue. And so it's a really great uh, treatise for uh, principles of upward influence, which is what mm -hmm. grassroots advocacy is, uh, mm -hmm. but it's an extremely uh, persuasive uh, way to do it. And so we encourage people to get involved however they can, because if a lawmaker doesn't hear from you, they don't know any better. They don't know. How do they know? Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's, it's, we wish they would be more proactive and talk to us about different things, but they can't know everything, you know, no. And, and there's a lot going out there. There's a lot going on. <laughs> yeah. We need to step up. Amy Showalter, CEO of the Showalter group. Again, check out showaltergroup.com and you can learn more about Amy and her team. Um, Amy, this has been great. Thank you so much. I've been really happy, Julia. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah. Thanks so much. It's been a lot of fun. Hey, I also want to make sure that I give a, an incredible shout out to our presenting sponsors. They include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Fundraisers Friday, our new episodes every Friday, dedicated to fundraising, and your part time controller. These are the folks that help us advocate if you will, for the nonprofit sector. We've done nearly 1,200 episodes and we're in our fifth year now. And these are the folks that stand behind us so that we can deliver these messages and make connections. Okay, Amy, thank you so much for breaking that first myth that we can't get involved. We can. Mm -hmm. And I really appreciate you. Thank you so very, very much. You're welcome. Thank you. It's been a lot of fun. We end each episode of the nonprofit show with this message. And it goes like this to stay well so you can do well. Thanks everyone, see you again.